This is University Lecture. Welcome to another in a series of lectures given on the campus of Iowa State University in Ames. Today we present the seventh of eight lectures recorded during the 1969 World Affairs Institute on the USSR, the second half century, as Robert F. Burns, professor of history at Indiana University, lectures on the topic, Russia and Eastern Europe, the Soviet Dilemmas. <music> professor Burns. My talk is going to be somewhat of a different character than the last two in particular because they were very scholarly and reflect a great deal of concentrated research on subjects on which these men had devoted a great deal of attention. I'm going to be talking uh, in an in a objective tone or in an attempt to be objective, but on a subject in which I'm just an interested and so, sort of anxious outside observer and one in which no one that I know of, at least, has any very solid information or any clear idea of the way things are likely to develop in the future. I might begin with my thesis so that you understand uh, the uh, apparent optimism that pervades my view of Russia's relations with Eastern Europe at a time when no one can be, at the moment, anything but pessimistic about the present situation. I don't expect any changes within the Soviet Union with regard to the nature or the quality of the Soviet political system. I wouldn't anticipate any changes for as far ahead as one can see. You can now rest assured, I suppose, that tomorrow Mr. Brezhnev and Mr. Kosygin will be overthrown. Uh, but even if they are, and I don't think this is very likely, I don't think there will be any changes in the system or in the attitude of the Russian people the peoples living in the Soviet Union towards the Soviet system. I do think, however, that the Russians have a, an impossible situation on their hands in Eastern Europe. On the surface, their situation could not be improved because they have about as complete control as one people have ever had over others. And their invasion, successful and skillfully carried out of Czechoslovakia last August, demonstrated in a very resounding way to all of the people who live in Eastern Europe, not only the power of the Soviet Union, but their resolution and their willingness to use that power. So on the surface, it looks as though the Soviet Union's position could not be better than it is in the fall of 1969. In fact, I think their long-term position is an impossible one. The reasons for this are I'll go into in some detail later. Some of them are the consequences of the achievements of the Soviet Union and the communists in the various East European countries. Others are the consequences of problems uh, which have arisen within those countries, particularly economic problems, which are beyond the capacity of those peoples and the Soviet government to resolve. Other problems are built in the nature of the East European people and are reflected in the word nationalism and in the revival of nationalism in these countries. Other problems are, uh, for the Soviets are located physically outside of Eastern Europe but have an enormous imp impression within Eastern Europe. One of these is the magnet, the magnetic influence that Western Europe in particular and what you might call the Western world in general has upon Eastern Europe and which in a sense pulls it out of the Soviet embrace regardless of what the Russians try to do with it. Another is the nature and the breakup of the international communist movement, which has made the Russians try to juggle 13 eggs and two hands, which in the long run will turn out to be impossible. And finally, there is the simple fact, I think, which you can find reflected in studies of empire throughout history and are perhaps best reflected in the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. The Russian Empire is simply overextended it will have to return to its natural borders. And one day or another, it will, simply because the Russians do not have the authority and in the long run will not have the resolution to maintain the only kinds of control that will enable them to remain there. That is the thesis uh, of my uh, sermon, you might say. Uh, 
tonight. I am, of course, talking about the future when a historian ought to be talking about the past. And there are hazards, of course, involved in this. Uh, perhaps this is best illustrated by a wonderful story I remember from The Economist of years ago about an American anthropologist who studied in Morocco in the early 1930s. And he discovered there that the woman occupied an inferior position there, quite different from that in which he occupies in the United States, where the women have long and skillfully ruled the country. <laughs> but he discovered that this was reflected in the simple fact that when a family walked from one village to another, the woman followed her husband about 15 feet behind as a reflection of her inferior and subject position. The American returned to Morocco in 1945 to discover that when a family walked from one village to another, the woman preceded her husband by 15 feet. He thought this reflected a social revolution of enormous significance and concluded originally that this reflected the American influence on Morocco from the presence there of American troops during the Second World War. He was quickly disabused, however, as you may be about the optimism of this lecture, when he learned that the area over which these people were walking had been mined. <laughs> Well, I'm walking over mine territory, but uh, I, I would hope you remember that I have indicated that I am aware of the hazards involved here. The last point in my thesis is the simple fact that I am convinced, and I'm sure the Russian leaders, whoever they are, are convinced, that Eastern Europe and the, main, the maintenance of Soviet control over Eastern Europe are absolutely essential to the survival of the Soviet Union and that the Soviet leaders, now at least, will do anything, as demonstrated by what they did in 1953 in Eastern Germany, and what they did in Hungary in 1956, and what they did in Czechoslovakia in 1968, to maintain that rule. Now, why is Eastern Europe so important to the Soviet Union? There are a number of reasons for this. And a foot, as a kind of footnote, and I do have to demonstrate that I am a scholar, of course, uh, as a kind of footnote, I'd like to say that you and I really don't understand Eastern Europe, and we don't know anywhere near as much about it as we ought to. There was a time only 20 years ago when we had a Secretary of State whose name also was Burns, but with whom I have no relationships whatsoever, who thought that the Tyrol in southern Austria and northern Italy was in fact a part of Finland. Since one of his functions at that time was to arrange the boundary between Austria and Italy, he was to some degree handicapped by that. <laughs> this is one kind of illustration of our ignorance. And most of us believe that the East Europeans are people who have very odd and un unpronounceable names, who eat garlic and in general smell in a very curious way, <laughs> who wear very strange and dark clothes, who eat very funny and strange foods, and who, when they come to the United States, distinguish themselves by playing halfback for Notre Dame or being outstanding mathematicians. Our, we really don't understand this area, and we generally take to ta tend to, to take what I would call the Anglo-Saxon view of Eastern Europe. It is, in other words, and has been for us, a kind of backward, unimportant area. Wars have come out of this area, of course, and that's unfortunate, but nothing else of any great significance except football players and mathematicians have come from it. It is, in fact, an enormously important part of the world, and it is, in fact, the central part of the world for the American people and the European people and the Soviet people, because if the present problems there are not resolved, World War III will almost inevitably come from it. Now, why is it, is it, why is it important, and why is it in particular important to the Russians? Well, one simple reason is that under Soviet control, which means I'm leaving or omitting here uh, Albania and Yugoslavia, there are something like 120 million people, which is about half the population of the Soviet Union and something like 60% of the population of the United States. This is a very large group of people. It is half as many people as live in the free countries of Western Europe. These people are by and large very talented, very skilled, and very highly educated. 
They have a imp very important role to play in Europe and to play in the world. Their total national income, or gross national product today, is something like 40% of the Soviet total. And in a sense, you can add that 40% to the Soviet total. It's a very significant part of the world, in other words, leaving out its geographical location. Now, it's important for other reasons also, particularly to the Russians. It's important for, as what I would call the cordon stalinaire of Russia. It's a barrier for Russia. It's an effort by the Russians to ensure that they will not be invaded again from the West. And here you must keep in mind that the Russians do have a fear complex, that they are, for perfectly justifiable reasons, frightened about invasion. If you read Russian history, you'll know that the Russians have been invaded over time by everyone except the American Indian. Those of you who remember the hist Western civilization courses, for example, re will remember all of the various barbarians who beat upon the walls of the Roman Empire. Most of them got there by marching over what is today southern Russia. And if you look at Russian history <coughs> excuse me, since 1500, you'll find that the Russians have been invaded by the Swedes, by the Poles, by the Turks, by the Germans, by the French in 1812, by almost everybody in stone's throw of their western frontiers. So the Russians do have a very justifiable fear of invasion from the west. And one of the central purposes to them of maintaining the kinds of controls they have now is to ensure that they will not be used again, that this area will not be a springboard by other peoples who will use the East Europeans as the Germans did and as the French did and as others have done again to invade Russia. Now it has other qualities also. It is also a springboard to the West. It is in fact, you might say, a pistol held against the head of Western Europe. Because while the Soviet control of the area, area provides some kind of assurance to Russia, at the same time, of course, it serves to frighten Western Europe because this very large Soviet forces in Eastern Germany and the very large Soviet forces in other countries such as Poland and Hungary and now Czechoslovakia and the existence of armies in those countries and the presence of thousands of Soviet missiles aimed at Western Europe, all of these things constitute a pistol to the head of the center of Western civilization and thereby have put Western Europe under some kind of insecurity and fear. Even more important than that, and these are very important facts of life which we tend to forget because we look at the surface as aspects of modern history, is the fact that the Soviet position in Eastern Europe provides the Soviet, a Soviet veto on the future of Germany. There can be no united Germany because the Russians sit on Eastern Germany unless that united Germany is one which is acceptable to the Soviet Union, which means, as we all know, really, one that is under absolute Soviet control. There can be no united Germany. Germany happens to be the most important and the central continental state in Europe. There can be no united Europe as long as Germany is divided. And in fact, perhaps the most important single aspect of Soviet position, the Soviet position in Eastern Europe is the fact that there is no Europe in 1969. Now when I went to college, and what I tend to think of more and more are the good old days when students were quiet in particular. When I went to college, there was a place called Europe, and no one that I ever read or heard ever talked about Eastern Europe and Western Europe because there was a cultural unity called Europe. It happened, of course, also then to be the motor of the world. It was the center of the world, even as late as 1939. And if you look at the history of the world, especially in the Christian era, you'll find that Europe has been the center. You, of you and I, of course, are a part of Europe, but we're on the fringes of Europe. Well, the simple fact is that there is no Europe today. The Hungarians are just as European as you and I are, the Poles are just as European as the Swedes, and the Bulgarians just as European as the French, but today they live under a kind of Eastern or Asian uh, part of the world. There is no Europe. Now, for Americans, this has a particularly poignant importance. It means, for example, that Europe, which used to be the center of the world, no longer plays the role in world politics, and all around the world, 
that it used to. And given the nature of the problems that the world has faced in the last 25 years, since that cultural and economic and political and spiritual center is no longer active, it means that another country and another people have had to step in and try to resolve the problems that the Europeans used to handle themselves. This is really the main reason for America's being so deeply involved in other parts of the world. To put it another way, if there were today a united Europe, an improved 1914 Europe, you and I would be a lot more secure and the world would be far more different than it is. But the Russians have the power and will retain the power to prevent that from happening and therefore to spin the rest of the world on into all of the problems under which it is, has stumbled and will continue to stumble. These are the, some of the reasons for which Eastern Europe is critical for the Soviet Union and the reasons therefore for which they will go to war, including the World War III at the moment at least, to maintain their position. Well, so much for that aspect. I'd like to look briefly, very briefly, at what Soviet policy has been over the last 20 years. And I'm sure you will appreciate that this is a kind of glorified shorthand, which gives me the opportunity to make a lot of wild generalizations, which you can think about and reject, but only after I've left town. <laughs> Basically, it's clear now, and there's a lot of evidence available that Stalin decided in de December 1942, January 1943, a number of very important things. One, Russia was not going to lose the war. Two, Russia was in fact going to win the war. Three, Russia would end up in control of Eastern Europe because she had driven the German armies out of Russia and across Eastern Europe, at least into Western Europe. Fourth, Russia might end up in control of Western Europe, or at least part of Western Europe. And fifth, he who controls Eastern Europe, and perhaps Western Europe as well, is well on the way to acquiring a dominant position in the world. So the Russians determined then to go as far as they possibly could to obtain these particular goals. And there's a great deal of correspondence which has been published, particularly between Tito and Stalin, which demonstrates these goals. Well, as we all know, by 1945, they had reached the lines uh, to which we had agreed with them during the late course of the war. The next two years, in a sense, they concentrated on settling down and clearing out the area and setting up governments which looked to be co what uh, some of our people today call, with regard to South Vietnam, coalition governments in which there were communists who happened to be in the most important positions in control of foreign affairs and the Ministry of the Interior and the Ministry of Defense, and which other parties, which were generally much larger than the Communist parties, also ostensibly at least shared power. So with these facade governments, the Soviet Union made peace treaties uh, with these countries and treaties involving the United States and other countries as well. As soon as all of the decencies and the legalities had been cleared away in 1947, then the Russians got down to business. And over the next four or five years, they first got rid of all of the other political parties which, with which they had been cooperating. They destroyed these parties by and large. They then began an attack on all of the rival or competing institutions to the Communist Party, beginning with the churches and the universities and then sweeping all through society. And then they began collectivization and nationalization and the transformation the entire intellectual and spiritual transformation of these peoples in an effort to make them what they were then called people's democracies, and ultimately, of course, the effort to make them the same kind of socialist state under Soviet control that the various Soviet republics are. By and large, this was carried out remarkably well. Uh, hundreds and thousands of people were killed, of course. All of the Soviet treaties and obligations were violated. They violated all of the human rights you can possibly think of, but they ended up in complete control of this territory and with loyal puppet governments. Now that is when their problems began. And in a very brief period since 1953, the Russians have tried to ride out the situation in which they have been in control of these countries, but have had on occasion to relax tensions or to establish policies which would allow those governments, with or without Soviet assistance,
to try to resolve the various economic and social problems with which they are faced. There are all kinds of slogans or words to cover this period, and there have been variations from time to time. They used to be called the new course, or the thaw, or the relaxation of tensions, or whatever. But the ma basic idea was to maintain Soviet control through what I think you can honestly call Soviet puppets, and at the same time to give enough light and air and freedom to get Western ideas and Western information in so that they could revive the economies in particular and keep these up, countries up to some degree with what was happening in Western Europe. By and large, this has been reasonably successful. They have had problems, of course. This got out of hand in 1956, and it got out of hand again in 1968. But at both of these occasions, the Russians had to intervene openly and with force to maintain their position, which, as I said before, is a very tight one and a very powerful one in 1969. Now, if you look at the Czechoslovak developments in the last few years, I think you can see a good illustration of the kinds of problems they have had, and I think also of the kinds of problems they will have in the future. The real problems in Czechoslovakia, for example, go back to the economic, or the economic collapse, or at least the economic stuttering of the machine in the early 1960s. In 1962, for example, Czech, the Czechoslovak economy was the only economy in the world which had a declining GNP uh, from the previous year. And I think it declined again in 1963. Uh, this meant, in other words, that one of the most advanced countries in Europe and in the world, <coughs> and in the world at a time when all of the other GNPs were going up 3%, 5%, 11% per year, was in fact going down. The Czech economists, good, loyal communists, loyal to their own country and loyal, they thought, to the Soviet Union, began to study this particular phenomenon and to introduce reforms of one kind or another simply to get their economy going. As they introduced reforms, which meant, for example, eliminating or removing, I shouldn't have word, used the word eliminate, I think this really reflects the Soviet influence on my own thought, but removing trusted party managers who've been put in important positions because of their loyalty and not because of their competence, giving the market economy a little more influence uh, being much more sensible and rational on investment policy and things of that kind. As the economists within the party and through the party introduced these changes, this led to other changes in Czechoslovakia. The Slovaks, for example, began to think more even than they had in the past that they should have a larger role in the administration of the Czechoslovak estate. The intellectuals began to think that they should have almost as much freedom as the economists had, and indeed more freedom such as Western European intellectuals had. The students became restive over little things like bad food. The workers became upset as the relaxations occurred in Czechoslovakia, and all of, out of all of this came the Czechoslovak reform, which led, of course, to August 1968. There is one other factor which one ought to keep in mind here, and that is the revival of Czech nationalism, or the expression of it as a culture. And this goes back to many things. It goes back to the men and the women who work on the farms and work in the factories of Czechoslovakia, who had never been taken in by the communist guff, so to speak, who had remained loyal to their values and their traditions. And when I say their traditions, I mean Comenius and Hus, and Mozart, and Masaryk, and the values and ideas for which these men stand. And this is one of the rocks on which the Czechoslovak communists stumbled in, 19, in the 1960s, and which led to 1968. Now, it seems to me that if you take a, a larger view at all of Eastern Europe, you can see these same factors in all of the countries, and you can see them uh, facing the Russians in the future. In short, one way to put my thesis, I suppose, is that the Russians resolved the crisis of 1968 by invading Czechoslovakia. They did not even face the problems which had brought about that crisis in 1968. In fact, those problems are worse now for the Czechs, the Slovaks, and above all the Russians than they were before. And they will, in fact, almost inevitably become worse in 
in the foreseeable future. Well, I'd like to look very briefly at these to run down in them in the same way in which I looked at them with regard to Czechoslovakia. One of these, are, you might say, is one of the achievements of the Soviet Union and the Communist parties in Eastern Europe. And this is a, this is a reflection of the economic development. You might even call it an economic or an industrial revolution in these countries, and the economic and the social consequences of that. of Bulgaria or Czechoslovakia and to push around men and women who work on farms and who are isolated and separated and powerless and who can only resist the way in which peasants have always resisted the external rulers of Eastern Europe, whether they be Austrians or Turks or Mongols. This is a fairly easy job to do and the Russians and their colleagues have done it rather effectively. However, when you change the economy of a country, when you enormously multiply the size of the working class, when you train hundreds and thousands of engineers and doctors and lawyers, in other words, when you carry out a social and an intellectual revolution, you have quite a different kind of people with whom to deal. Because when you, cl when you collectivize a farm, you can annoy a few powerless peasants and maybe do some damage to agricultural production. But when you try to terrorize engineers or think of closing down a factory or introduce controls that are unpalatable to your highly educated people, you create very serious problems because of the nature of the modern economy. And one of the consequences, therefore, of the achievements of the communist system is that they now have economic and social problems which they did not have to face in 1948. Now there's another way in which to put this and to give you another look at it. And that is to say that the revolution has succeeded from the Soviet point of view. And as Mr. Toynbee once said, there's nothing that fails like success. I can illustrate this with a, an anecdote. I remember talking two or three years ago to two Hungarians, a man and his wife, who told me, I assume all of this is true, uh, who told me that they were ostensibly or on the surface very, very successful. They were members of a party to which they had devoted all of their adult lives in a party which was now ruling the country. They had very high positions. One of them was the head of the party in the main university in Hungary. The other was a full professor in his discipline. They had a very good apartment. They lived very well indeed. In fact, the gap, economic gap, between the professor in Hungary and the skilled worker in Hungary is about five times what it is in a country like the United States. In other words, on the surface, and this is almost as symbolic in terms of the Soviet position in Eastern Europe, they were extraordinary successes. On the other hand, they said, we are utter failures because we have two children a boy of 19 and a girl of 21. They have had all of the advantages that we did not have. We spent years in prison. We fought for the party in the underground. We devoted our lives to the party in the hard years after the war. These youngsters have had the opportunity of living well in this country, of a university education. They couldn't care less about communism or the Communist Party. They will not join the Young Communist League they have no interest in our, in our ideals and in our values and in all of the things that we have done. In other words, as good communist Hungarian parents, we are forced to say that our lives are dreadful failures. Now this really always happens when you have a successful revolution because the sons and daughters and the second generation are willing to enjoy the fruits of the revolution and all of its achievements but they don't have the same zip and the same dynamism and the same enthusiasm. They are, in fact, what uh, someone, I think, Pareto called the little foxes, the little foxes who gnaw the vine. They are people who are willing and able to recognize a bandwagon and get aboard the bandwagon. 
to join the party on occasion and get the benefits that the party and party membership will provide, but they don't have the same interest and the same values. This has happened all through Eastern Europe. To put it another way, Marxism-Leninism is irrelevant in Eastern Europe today. One of the planners in one of these countries, for example, told me this in just these words a few years ago. He said, I think that Marx was the greatest man, the, world, the greatest philosopher that the world has ever produced. There's no question about it. I think Lenin was the greatest man the world has ever produced. I have no question about that either. But Marx died, say, in 1882, and Lenin died in 19, uh, 1924. And I'm dealing with the Hungarian economy in 1965. And these people could not have had in mind any of the political and economic and scientific and technical problems with which we have to deal. You can read Marx and Lenin in the face, but they will not tell you how to introduce the computer into the Hungarian economy. We have to go to Harvard and Iowa State and places like that to learn to resolve the problems that face us now because Marx and Lenin are irrelevant. Well, and they are irrelevant. They don't have anything to say to the people who are dealing with the practical problems and even the larger problems in Eastern Europe. And this is one of the ironies of history, that the Russians and their colleagues there have produced a situation which has given them more problems than they had in 1948. Another problem which is perhaps just as important and which about which I can't speak quite so clearly is the simple fact that these countries now face economic problems and scientific problems which are, it is beyond their capacity to resolve. Uh, briefly here, my thesis is that in the last few years, Western Europe and the United States together, perhaps more the United States, have gone through a kind of scientific and technical revolution. You and I live it and see it to such a point that we don't understand it. But anyone who had taught at Iowa State 40 years ago and returned to this campus now would recognize the extraordinary revolution that has occurred in this university and in this state, and in fact in the United States in general. And he would also recognize that this is only the beginning, that the economic and scientific revolution is just now on a kind of takeoff stage for the United States. And that we in Western Europe are beginning to pull away from Eastern Europe in particular. In other words, in spite of all of the efforts that the East Europeans and the Russians have made, they are in fact now further behind Western Europe and the United States, particularly in science and in the ways in which scientific discoveries are introduced into the modern economy. Now there are a number of answers to this. Of course, one is for the East Europeans to turn to the Russians who are superior to them in these endeavors and to ask for and receive assistance. But the Russians are basically a very selfish people. They don't believe in giving assistance even to their friends. Footnote, check with the Chinese communists on this. And secondly, the Russians really don't have enough of this kind of assistance to spare because their own economy is straining to keep up or to, to maintain the gap at its pre present level between the Soviet Union and the United States. The alternative, of course, is to turn to Western Europe and the United States for assistance. But that's precisely what led to the problem in Czechoslovakia in 1968. So there's no real way out of this problem for the East Europeans. One very good illustration of this, for example, is that the Czechs really are faced with this problem very concretely. One of the discoveries of the Czech economists, for example, was the fact that their uh, equipment in their textile industry in 1965 was on the average 63 years old. It had been put in by and large in 1902. Well, this meant that the Czechs were competing in the production of textile goods with countries like Germany, which had had its textile industry destroyed during the war and which had new equipment, none of it older than 18 years old and much of it only two years old, in which a man could do what 500 men could do in Czechoslovakia simply by pushing a button. This was the case in India and the case in England and the case in the United States as well. The Czechs therefore need this new equipment. They cannot make it themselves. The Russians don't have it or won't sell it to them. The Czechs have to get it from the United States or Western Europe. They're not allowed to buy it. They don't in fact have the dollars to buy it. 
And last year, after the invasion, when they turned to the Russians for $500 million of dollars to enable them to buy Western equipment to modernize their economy, the Russians said no, as they said again no just recently. And the first economic agreement that the new Czech government completed with the Russians after the invasion was, believe it or not, one in which the Czechs provided economic assistance to the Russians, with the Czechs agreeing to manufacture piping for the Russian oil lines, with the Russians to begin payment in 1975. Now this is the kind of assistance that's going to sink Czechoslovakia, and it's a reflection of the very real needs that the Czechs have. In other words, the gap is growing between Western Europe and Czechoslovakia and the other countries of Eastern Europe, and there's no way now that any of the people there uh, can resolve that, in spite of the, any investment they put into research and development, in spite of all of the lessons they can get by reading the management books put out in the United States. They will not be able to keep up. They will, in fact, fall further and further behind. And the economic consequences and the social and political consequences of that by 1975, or you might even say by 1984, are very difficult ones for these people and the Russians to face. Now another reason is the revival, the survival, and then the revival of nationalism in all of these countries. I mentioned this in Czechoslovakia. It has occurred other, in other areas too. There are many sources of this. I think the main source really are the ordinary people of these countries who have kept the faith, so to speak, who have gone to their churches, whatever their churches are, who have baptized their children, who have taught their children about the true history of their countries as compared with the history which they get in the schools, who have kept alive the old customs and the old traditions and the old values. Later on, the intellectuals began to rediscover their history. As Mr. Klein mentioned this afternoon, many Russian intellectuals are now rediscovering their own philosophy of the 19th century. And even party officials began to discover their history and to some degree almost inevitably to glorify their history. So there is to some degree a kind of spirit of independence in all of these countries, which makes them inevitably much more difficult for the Russians to deal with. Now I'm in a facetious way would like to suggest that if I were Gomułka in Poland, for example, there are a number of things I would do, assuming I retain his political philosophy. One is that I would prevent anyone from coming to Iowa State to work with Professor Hetty, because he is in fact a very revolutionary force in Eastern Europe, because the ideas that economists acquire at this university go back and ultimately lead to August 1968 in Czechoslovakia. Another thing I would do is to shoot all the grandmothers in Poland because it's the grandmothers who are the bearers of the traditional values in Poland and in these other countries. And since the mother works and the fathers work in Poland, the children are brought up by and large by the grandmothers. And the grandmothers, as like all grandmothers, I suppose, are conservative or at least more conservative than we are and it's the grandmothers in these countries that have given these little kids between the ages of three and seven the basic ideas which survive with them the rest of their lives. And one of the best ways to kill nationalism in these countries is simply to kill the grandmothers. Well, happily, uh, Gamolka has not sought my advice <laughs> on this particular, <laughs> particular <coughs> uh, incident, but that is an illustration of the long roots that nationalism has. Nationalism, it seems to me, is going to grow and grow and grow in this country, in Western Europe, in Eastern Europe, in every part of the world. In many areas of the world, this is going to create problems for us. In many areas, especially in Eastern Europe, it's going to create problems for the Russians. And these are problems that it is almost beyond the capacity of man to control. You cannot rewrite the past quite that effectively for people who are as proud and stubborn and difficult as the various East European peoples have been. Now, if you look outside of Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, you see some of these other forces. One of them I've mentioned very briefly, and that is the magnetic power of Western culture. Now, this can be demonstrated in very few ways. I would almost defy any of you to suggest any aspect of Russian culture 
which has had a significant or even a popular influence in any other part of the world in the last 15 years. I would omit, of course, here the old traditional Russian culture like the Bolshoi Ballet, which is 100 years old, or caviar, which is older than that, or vodka, which is perhaps almost immemorial in its history. But if you eliminate that, and if you look at the forces that are interesting and exciting the young and the lively all around the world, where do they come from? What is the source of the miniskirt, which is the most revolutionary force introduced anywhere, I think, <laughs> maybe even exceeding the power of the atomic bomb and its social implications in particular? Where does the hula hoop come from? Where does bebop and jazz and all of these things come from? Where do all the crazy styles of clothing that people wear? Where do jeans come from? Where do all of these things come from that are now sweeping and have for a long time swept Eastern Europe? They all come from the West. In other words, the Iron Curtain has not been effective, and it probably cannot be effective. There is so much vitality and drive and enthusiasm and newness in Western culture that it has an, a magnetic and almost an hypotic, hypnotic influence on Eastern Europe. And you can almost see Eastern Europe being pulled westward by these forces. I've just listed the more superficial of them, but they also come down to computers and the Harvard Business School, and professors here, and all of the intellectual and social achievements of the Western world in the last 20 years. It's these things that are affecting the peoples of Eastern Europe. They're studying English and speaking English, not Russian. They're reading Hemingway, Hemingway and all of the mod, ar mod authors, mad authors, I would almost say, in the West, rather than the Soviet writers of the 20th century, or even the Russian writers of the 19th century. The cultural pull is just extraordinary. To put it another way, the Soviet impact culturally on these areas is almost invisible. And any of you who have been in Eastern Europe will have to scrape to find any social influence or cultural influence coming from the Soviet Union. One of the reasons, of course, is that the Soviet Union itself is intellectually and spiritually dead. There's a wonderful article in Foreign Affairs by Isaiah Berlin of about 10 years ago, which makes this point very well. The, si the title is The Silence in Russian Culture. And it is a silent culture. In fact, the only lively parts of it are those that we can read in the West, but which are denied to the Russians themselves. So the West has an overwhelming influence, and the Iron Curtain and jamming and this kind of thing cannot prevail against this very powerful force. The other forces that I'd mention are the collapse of the international communist movement, which has just fallen apart before our very eyes. None of us, I suspect, will ever have the opportunity to return to the 16th century to see the Reformation, but you don't really have to because you have seen it taking place in your, right before our eyes in the 1950s and the 1960s. The Reformation in the communist movement has occurred, and it will continue in the years ahead. I live in a city which has 40,000 people and 38 different churches. This is one of the consequences of the Reformation. There are now a number of independent communist parties, and there will be more independent communist parties, just as there are more, there is more than one church in the city of Bloomington, Indiana. There's nothing the Russians can do to bring the international communist movement together. It is, in fact, Humpty Dumpty, but it's Humpty Dumpty which has fallen off the wall and which cannot be put together again. And the more the Russians scramble to influence that party and bring this party back into the fold, the more they will fumble other parties out of the fold. So they're going to be left, really, without any real influence or the great kind of influence they've had in the past. And this will inevitably have a very powerful effect in Eastern Europe. Now, the last thing I'd like to mention is another uh, aspect of political of politics, which de Tocqueville talked about roughly uh, 50 years ago. And this is one way in which I'd like to introduce the dilemmas of the Soviet system. You remember, I trust, that just about a half an hour ago I was talking about how important this area is and why it is absolutely central to the Soviet Union. There's one other aspect of Soviet control which is important, and that is that I believe the Russian people would not allow any Russian government to give up 
or to loosen significantly the controls they now exercise in Eastern Europe. In other words, the Russian government is not free to do what it wishes in Eastern Europe. And if Khrushchev or if Brezhnev and Kosygin should go to Shangri-La tomorrow, first of all, should find it, and then go there and then announce that they wish the Russian government to surrender its control over Eastern Europe, they would be overthrown almost immediately because almost all Russians wish the Soviet Union to retain that position. And this is one of the problems, one of the dilemmas of the Soviet Union. And in a sense, there are three possible policies which they could follow. One of these is to maintain the present arrangement, whatever that is. And I must say it's a very difficult one to define. To try to rock along, to maintain this present sort of combination between slapping the boys when they get out of hand, as they did last year on one hand, and introducing a thaw or a new course or a relaxation of, a, of tensions on occasion on the other hand, and to keep the boat rocking between, say, 45 and 55 percent, always varying a little bit, but maintaining basic control with a little relaxation at one time and a little toughness at another. This is impossible. This is as impossible as returning to 1929 or 1914. You cannot freeze a situation like this. But you might have been able to do it in the 19th century, which was not an era of great change. But as you and I know, and as everyone in the world knows, there's never been an era of change as we have been witnessed in the last third of the 20th century. And that change is going to speed up as time goes on. You cannot help and wage wars of liberation in one part of the world and repress the East Europeans in the other part. In other words, the Russians cannot stumble along with the kind of policy have they have had or have followed just the last year. There are two other alternatives. One is to get tough, to return to the kind of controls that they had, say, from 1949 or so through 1953, the absolute and full Soviet authority exercised discreetly through a facade of puppets. But this won't work either for a number of reasons. One of the reasons are the nature of the problems, which I mentioned before. For example, if they should do this in Czechoslovakia, if they should deny just to take one of these six problems they face, if they should continue to deny the Czechoslovaks the opportunity to trade with the West, to borrow from the West, to introduce Western professors and Western technology and ideas into the Czech economy. If they refuse that, the Czech economy will almost inevitably spill downhill. And in five or 10 years, this will mean that the Russians will have to come in with a very large kind of martial aid program to get that economy going again. But in the meantime, all of the other problems that I mentioned before will become far more serious. In other words, the Russians can't really crack down. And of course, if they also crack down, they will have other consequences as well. They will clearly drive the West European communist parties outside of the international communist movement once and for all. They will alienate the Indians, even the Indians, who are very difficult for the Russians to alienate. They will alienate the Indian Communist Party. They will split communist parties all over the world. They will contribute to the demise of the international communist movement. They will, of course, also wake up people around the world, some in Western Europe and some in the United States, as to the real nature of Soviet communism and to the threat which Soviet communism faces for the rest of the world. And they will also, of course, in the long run, create problems for themselves back home. Because I think that there are no real problems within the Soviet Union now, but if they should maintain a repressive regi regime of the old-fashioned Stalinist type in Eastern Europe, there will very clearly be problems back in Russia as more and more Russians feel uncomfortable and then begin to protest about it. The last option they have, of course, is to introduce some kind of relaxation, to uh, go back to the period after 1956, to say to the Czechs that this was all an unfortunate mistake. And we hope you increase your exchanges with Iowa State. And we wish very much that you borrow $500 million from the Chase National Bank. And we hope you allow West German businessmen into Czechoslovakia to revive your flagging economy. 
and to help re in other ways to resolve all of the other problems which you face. The tragedy with this, of course, is that once this problem, this attitude is adopted, the situation which led to 1956 will reoccur. In fact, even more poignantly, the situation which led to the Czechoslovak Spring and ultimately to August 1968 will reoccur and the Russians will be back where they were before, except that they will be much further down the road than they were before. Because when you look back at the history of the last 20 years, you'll notice that the Russians have been very lucky in many ways. One little element for, of luck, for example, is that the East Germans kicked up their heels in 1953. The Poles did it in the spring of 1956. The Hungarians did it in the fall of 1956. The Romanians did it in quite a different way, spelled over, spilled over three or four years in the middle 1960s. And the Czechoslovaks did it in 1968. In other words, they all happened to do this at a different time. But the Russians will probably not be so lucky the next time because the new problems are going to be as more serious than the old ones as 1968 was in 1956. And next time, it may very well be that the East Europeans will acquire the same problems and the same attitudes at exactly the same time so that instead of an isolated rebellion in one country, the Russians will face trouble in four or five countries. And this will make it very much more difficult to handle. Now, I mentioned to Tocqueville earlier, and perhaps I can demonstrate the problem by referring to what Tocqueville, de Tocqueville wrote in the 1830s, shortly after he had visited the United States. He said in brief, the best form of government is a monarchy. <clears throat> in fact, the ideal form of government is an enlightened despotism, and, or maybe even what you might call a, a time when you have a philosopher as a king, because then you have an enlightened ruler surrounded by the best minds and the most informed minds who can inform him about the proper policies which he ought to follow to ensure his position and the security of the state. And if he has the power and good advisors and resolution, he will have no problems because the people will know him better than to revolt. There are no real difficulties for an enlightened despot if he's tough. On the other hand, he said, a democratic government, such as I've seen in the United States, strikes me as the worst form of government conceivable to man. Because you have a leader who is elected by a populace, which is not informed, which is in fact likely to be inflamed by passions of one kind or another, and which is likely to change its mind between 1968 and 1970 and 1972, in other words, you have a government installed by the people least qualified to choose the government, one which is not well informed, and one which is very unstable indeed. It's the worst form of government you could possibly devise. Now the tragedy, he says, is that those people in charge of the best form of government wish to be loved, they want to be popular, and in order to increase their popular support, they relax the despotism. They lift up the, the top of the box a little bit, to let in a little light and a little air, and to encourage a little clapping and applause. And when they do this, they get into trouble with two or three different kinds of people. The monarch is criticized on one hand by what we would call the left guard, who say that this is a betrayal of the system and you should put the bottom to put the top down tight again. You get trouble on the right from conservative, uh, from uh, what we would call liberals, who say you should go further than this. This is not a satisfactory arrangement. We need a little more liberalism. So in other words, you split the ruling group where you previously had, previously had absolute unity. But even more troublesome is that you have awakened the sleeping masses, the sleeping beasts who were content in the box and who knew they'd be banged on the head before but who have now been given a little light and a little air, and who have learned that the appetite grows by, feed, by feeding. And the more light in the air and the more you relax, the more troubles you have. So that moving from an enlightened despotism towards some form of democracy splits the ruling class and makes the people who have previously been quiet very restless indeed. And there is a point beyond which it in fact becomes impossible to put the top of the box on again. And then you have a revolution. Well, I think in a sense this is where the Russians are in Eastern Europe. 
And this is, in a sense, the, a good description of the kinds of dilemmas which they follow or face. They cannot stay where they are. In this case, not just because the ruler wants to be popular, but because of the nature of the forces that flow through any modern society. They cannot move to one direction or the other because they will create troubles within the ruling group and among the peoples whom they, among whom they live. This is why I think that in the long run, the Soviet position is impossible in Eastern Europe. Now, of course, no professor likes to leave his audience without an answer to the problems which he has uh, described. And I would like to say now that I don't have any answers. And I'm not sure what we can do uh, to assist here. But I would like to say in conclusion that there are a number of very obvious facts of life that stare you and me in the face. One is that in spite of the fact that the Russians crushed the only kind of change which is really possible and fruitful and peaceful in the long run, that is a slow and gradual change, that you and I and our government and other governments must encourage that slow and peaceful and gradual change in Eastern Europe. We should discourage revolution, which is not at all likely anyway, because violence there would be counter-destructive. It would enormously increase the danger of war, and it would simply lead the Russians to tighten up even more ferociously than they did under Stalin. So we have one obligation, and that is to do what we can to assist these people and the Russians to enable the East Europeans to engage in some kind of slow and peaceful and gradual change, which will enable them one day to become far more free than they are, and maybe as free as we are. And of course, no people today is free. This will enable the East Europeans to join the West Europeans and to reconstitute Europe, which should be one of our goals, that is, it should be the goal of any civilized person in the 20th century, because there will be no peace anywhere in the world until Europe has been reconstituted as a free society or a free community, enabling it to help the rest of us, the Russians on one hand and the Americans on the other, to face all of the truly supernatural problems almost that face all peoples and which do not recognize boundaries of any kind. Now, in conclude, the last thing I would like to say is that it strikes me that programs such as this and courses such as those taught by Professor Thien and other courses that enlighten us and our undergraduates and our graduate students and the American public in general about the nature of the world in which you and I live and in which the Russians and the Chinese live are absolutely essential in the modern world. We cannot turn out people who think that the Tyrol is in Finland. We cannot turn out people who have the old-fashioned Anglo-Saxon view of the world. One of the obligations of all universities, my university and your university, is to increase the knowledge and the understanding of other peoples, because that is really the last best hope that you and I have. Now, even this is not enough. Knowledge is never enough. And I think we not only have to be better informed about these people and other people and to learn more than we now know about the rest of the world, but we also have to be more resolute uh, than we have been, particularly in the recent past. I remember in Mr. Kennedy's inauguration, Robert Frost used a very compelling phrase. He said, be more Irish than Harvard. Now, what did he mean? When he meant Harvard, I assume he meant what I've just been talking about, that is increasing knowledge and increasing understanding, increasing wisdom. In all of the schools of the university and throughout the United States, and when he said, when he said be more Irish, I think he meant that knowing is not enough. You've got to be compassionate, you've got to be tough, which are the Irish virtues. And it seems to me that given the situation the Russians face and the East Europeans face, we have to follow that particular advice. Thank you very much. You have been listening to another in a series of lectures given on the campus of Iowa State University in Ames.
Today you heard one of the lectures from the 1969 World Affairs Institute on the USSR, the second half century. Today's topic was Russia and Eastern Europe, the Soviet dilemmas. And the speaker was Robert F. Burns, professor of history at Indiana University. Next week, H. Kent Geiger, professor of sociology at the University of Wisconsin, lectures on the distribution of values and interests in the Soviet class system. University Lectures, a presentation of Iowa State University Radio.